Welcome to Unload and Show Clear, powered by Match Shark. Listener ready? Stand by. Welcome to another episode of Unload and Show Clear, a podcast about the men and women who compete in IDPA matches around the world. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey. IDPA, International Defensive Pistol Association, was formed out of the concealed carry movement back in the 1990s based on the founder's desire for a sport based on real-world defensive skills and not just fancy equipment. IDPA matches are a series of stages that are based on realistic defensive scenarios, and they'll test the shooter's skills in gun handling, accuracy, speed, and problem solving. Men and women from around the world compete every week in IDPA matches, and here at Unload and Show Clear, we introduce you to those people. We talk one-on-one, people, not politics. These are not professional athletes. They're everyday men and women, your neighbors, your co-workers, public servants, your kids' teachers, and you're going to meet one of those great people today. And for 2020, Unload and Show Clear is powered by Matt Shark. If you watch videos from last year's IDPA World Championship 2019, you will see that shooters had to deal with the discomfort of shooting in sometimes heavy rain. If you were at that match, or if you were with me at the 2019 Arkansas State match, you know how much fun it can be to shoot in the rain, especially heavy rain. Why do I say that? Well, pasting and scoring targets is not fun at all. Not only are you and your equipment soaked, not only are you cold and wet and damp and uncomfortable, but pasting and scoring targets makes your day even that much more fun. You can't see the scoring zones. The pasters and the tape won't stick to the targets. The targets ultimately will disintegrate because they get waterlogged and have to be changed more frequently. Well, contrast that Arkansas State match to the World Championship and compare the targets. There was a big difference. The difference was you had baggies on the Arkansas targets and you had match shark covering the world championship targets. Match Shark's patent-pending target shields keep targets dry even in heavy rain. They're reusable too, so the cost of those shields is quickly recovered by simply patching and reusing them over and over and over again because you're not shooting the shield, you're shooting the the backer that, that holds the shield to the target stand. Well, once you're done, you just take the things off slap a little paster on it. Uh, There's a tape paster that covers up the holes. Boom, you're set to reuse it over and over and over again. And it makes your staff happier because setup and scoring and teardown are so much easier. It makes your shooters happier because they can see the targets and they don't have to deal with plastic bags. They're designed and manufactured right here in the United States. They are owned and operated by... Two IDPA shooters themselves, people experienced in match uh, direction and setup, uh, Will and Chris Schmeed, whom you've heard on this podcast, they understand the challenges that match staff face when dealing with wet weather. So let them help you run your matches faster and smarter and make it a better experience for your safety officers and your shooters. Visit MatchShark.com today and get everything you need to be prepared for your next rainy day match. That's MatchShark.com. Visit them today. MatchShark.com. Our special guest today is Steve Prater from Mineola, Texas. Steve, welcome to the show. It's great to finally have you here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting us to do this. Well, tell us a little about yourself. And uh, you were you were mentioned quite a bit. Uh, had a little shout out in our in our interview with uh, um, with Samuel Chambers at our last uh, last show. Tell us a little bit about yourself and and what you do for a living there in Mineola. Uh, right now, I am a stay at home father. Uh, I kind of uh, it's been a weird trail getting here. I have four children. I have uh, three boys and a, and a younger daughter. Uh, my oldest son, Jackson, has shot IDPA for uh, a few years, and he is now married and works for uh, Dallas Police Department. And a lot of the guys at the matches and uh, 
have seen us there, you know, with him shooting as a junior shooter. And now uh, Evan shoots with me, but uh, it pretty much all got started uh, about 10, 11 years ago. Uh, I went to a match and uh, not really a stranger to competitive shooting. We'd done, uh, you know, IPSC, USPSI type things, you know, years uh, ago, even before I got married. And uh, then after I got married, my wife and I did cowboy action shooting. And uh, long story short, Tyler had a club that kind of folded. Um, and, and I think it was kind of a lack of leadership thing. They had some people that were shooting pretty regular. And about that time was when I took over a management position at the indoor range and Tyler was a lock and load indoor shooting range. Mm -hmm. And so I had been invited to a couple of matches. They were shooting at 31 West shooting range, just west of Tyler at the time. And uh, we got to batting around the idea of, man, we could do this indoors. You know, I mean, we could, we can build some walls and hang it from the target carrier railing. And, you know, and so we kind of, looked into what we needed to do to get established as a, as a club and host a few matches. And it just really took off. Um, I know you've got people listening nationwide, but you know, the East Texas IDPA groups, a good size group. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's a, it's a quite a number of people, you know, when we go to sanction matches that are within, I'd say a three or four state area, a lot of times we've got two full squads of nothing, but just East Texas IDPA shooters. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh they do well and and so it, things kind of took off uh we had uh, quite a few uh new people who just really got involved and kind of took the reins and, and it was a great thing to see uh you know like sam chambers who was on your show the other day you know he came to the indoor range and that's how he got started uh, the Petties, Ben Petty and Caleb, I mean, you know, who doesn't know them? And, and they kind of got started there. And, uh, you know, Mark Thompson and Nicole, Nicole came in and got interested, and that's how she met Mark. And uh, and so it's sort of a, yeah, it's a, like a family thing, <laughs> you know. Um, but, um, you know, the, of course, the, the range uh, shut down, I guess, seven or eight months after I had left. Uh, uh, I've had health issues and, and things were getting slow there anyhow. So we, we moved the club south of Tyler to a new location. Um, and we lasted there for maybe a year because they just, it was just a schedule conflict. Uh, we, you know, it just wasn't working with them and us. And so Kelly Smith, who's a constable for precinct two here in Wood County and Mineola had a little bitty range and, one of our club members who is a friend of his told him that we were looking for a place and talked to him about the following and that we thought that, uh, you know, if we built a place that we could probably host matches, you know, on a regular basis and bless his heart, he just built the, bit the bullet and just built the facility. Uh, I mean, it was totally wooded and they just leveled everything and, and put in a really decent sized range for us. And so that's where we are now here in Mineola. So, so where is, where is Mineola in relation to say Tyler and Longview? Well, it's, it's uh, to give you a better picture, you know, they're, they're interstate 20, mm -hmm. right, you know, east to west, but the old highway 80 that parallels interstate 20, Mineola is on highway 80 and almost exactly directly between Shreveport and Dallas. Okay. All right. Almost a little distance right in between, just, just kind of north of Tyler. Gotcha. Okay. We're like a 35 to 45 minute drive from Longview, from Tyler to the south of us, and about an hour from Canton to the west of us. So, I mean, we're just kind of like right in between. Yep. And, and so, a couple of hours from, uh, from uh, Collin County and um, what, maybe two and a half from, uh, maybe three from um, what, uh, Cross Timbers over on the other side of the Metroplex. So you're, you're in a kind of the sweet spot. Yeah, it, it, we are. I, you know, Mineola is a small town uh, and, and, you know, we're struggling with getting new people to get involved from Mineola, but there's people from outside of Mineola County. The neat thing is IDPA being what it is, uh, in this neck of the woods, Canton, Tyler, 
Longview, East Texas Rifle Pistol Club in Longview, and us, we all agreed that we were not going to schedule any IDPA matches that conflicted with each other. So that's the beauty of it. Every weekend in East Texas, you can go to an IDPA match if you want to. Well, take a step back real quick here. Let's. How did you get – are you originally from East Texas? Yes, sir. Born and raised in Tyler. All right. Okay. So – um, what, where was the introduction to guns? Was it as a kid growing up or was it, I know I ask this question every time because it's always interesting to hear how people or get involved with guns and, and how that, how that transition of, from firearms to competitive shooting, how that happens. So how did it happen for you? Man, I got to tell you, uh, my dad was a rifle instructor in the national guard. And so when he got out, and when I was young, I had this interest in guns. He wanted nothing to do with it. I mean, he was sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, his memories were not that great, you know. And so when I was like uh, 13, 14, he bought me a beautiful pigeon grade 870 12 gauge. It was wonderful. And uh, once or twice a year, we would go visit my mother's uncle. They had this farm out near Hamilton. And he'd, here's a box of shells, here's a shotgun, go, you know. <laughs> And it's, uh, that was kind of it. But to be honest with you, down inside of me, I've always just been a pistol arrow. I love handguns. I, I'm just fascinated with handguns. And my dad wouldn't have nothing to do with handguns. It just wasn't happening. So uh, <laughs> basically what happened, I went to a private school, uh, second through 12th grade. And it was small, so we had no organized sports. So I played soccer, coached, played, refereed. I mean, it, it just... It was soccer every day. And uh, I had an accident playing indoor soccer uh, when I was 20 and just completely destroyed my leg. I, it was a, a terrible hyperextension. I mean, every leg, m- meniscal thing. It was just, I was a year and a half on crutches. It was terrible. Uh, and repairs didn't really go well. I mean, it was, it was a pretty bad thing. And a friend of mine, his mother got a little gun shop in a divorce. What? And, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. He was really cool. You know, it was this little little gun shop called Great Guns. It was out on Highway 31 West. And uh, I, I stopped by there one day just on a whim, uh, went hobbling in, you know, to, to say hi to her. And she was getting ready to expand the floor space. And she said, why don't you come here and work for me? She said, right now, I don't need anything, but anybody just to sit in the corner and be up here with me, help me keep an eye on the place. And I've been in the gun business ever since. <laughs> I, it wasn't what I wanted to do when I got out of high school. I really wanted to go to Waco, Texas State Technical, you know, and right. take building construction. I mean, still to this day, my dream was to build houses and have a bunch of kids. That was the only two things I wanted when I was in high school and graduated. Big happy family built houses and uh and i wound up working in that gun shop uh until i finished healing up and once i got to where i was moving around good there was a local group of guys who put a uh, ipsit club together and it just all started there just all started there <laughs> the love of handguns and the and and the athletic the interest in athletics all tied together and there you go yeah, yeah. and so uh the the nice thing about working in gun shops is every new gun that came in or every <laughs> there pretty that caught my attention. I bought it. I took it home. I learned how to break it down to the last little spring and screw, learned how to polish them, do action work, do all that. And then sure enough, that's what I wound up doing for a living was, you know, gun repair and pistol smithing and that kind of thing. And uh, it just never worked out where I could get out of it. <laughs> And I know that sounds ugly, like I was trying to get out of it, but it wasn't, you know, my dream job. And, and you know, you, when your hobby becomes a job, it, it's, it takes a little of the luster, you know. Mm. And, uh, but it's just, it's just what I wound up doing. It's just, you know. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of how I got in, involved in it. And uh, So who still- introduced you to, to, so who was it introduced you to IDPA? You've been you've been a member since two thousand ninety nine or two thousand something like that. 
you know, I think I had a membership because I went to a match and then I wound up away for a couple of years. So I, you know, I knew this interview was coming. I, I thought he's going <laughs> I don't know. So I know I shot a classifier in 2010. It's still on record. Um, but what it was, the guys at Cone County, um, uh, and, uh, and just talk about a great group of people. Long story short, there was an old preacher that I met while he was a missionary in Mexico. I went on a mission trip and met him down there. And uh, just crazy guy's name is Ron McCann. And after my daddy died, he just stepped in and filled the role of my daddy. Mm -hmm. Just just a wonderful man. And uh, he and a fellow by the name of Ray Davis and, and some other guys, they were going and shooting at Greenville. And so he's like, no, oh, you need to get off work. Come shoot IDPA with us. You know, come on and do it. And Ron was one of those guys where you couldn't shoot the match series because he's always horsing around, you know. And we just had a ball. And, and that's, that, that's what set the hook. Uh, it just it's kind of set the hook. And it was really funny. A lot of people joke about it because when we started our indoor club at the indoor range, you know, Easily half the guys that were shooting with us when they first started were <laughs> pastors or deacons or <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it with all these religious people in here at these pistols, you know, but, but we just had a ball, had a ball. <laughs> uh, Steve Shipley and the guys from, from Big Rock were involved and, and, uh, and uh, it just, uh, it, that, that's where it started. You know, it started and for a while there, uh, and this world of gray hair and the bad health really doubled. I was uh, uh, managing the indoor range. And we were doing the, the club thing there. And I was pastoring a church and trying to take care of my mother here because it was ill. And, and boy, I mean, we just had a lot on our plate there, you know, for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but the IDPA thing... Uh, really we got kind of more serious about it uh after about five or six years at the church i was at i left and it gave me more time with my family and, it, and just to be honest with you, i was working so much and was so tied up with the church outside of work that i really wasn't spending time with my kids like i needed to be mm -hmm. and IDPA was one of the most wonderful things that could have happened to me then because I had time on weekends. I said, you know, Jackson, why don't we go to a sanctioned match? <laughs> so for the first couple of years when he was really young, uh, that we went to sanctioned matches, we made family trips out of it and, and we'd get a hotel room and we'd get suites, you know, cause there's a bunch of us. We get double beds and <laughs> hide of sofas, try to find a hotel at the indoor pool. And Jackson and I would get up and we'd go to the match. And my wife, Erica, she'd stay back at the hotel with the rest of the kids and they'd stay at the hotel and swim in the pool and we'd make a family outing of it. And uh, we did that for, I don't know, a couple of years, two, three years. And then we figured out that, well, we weren't really shooting as well as we could have been because we were worn out before the match from <laughs> you know, the trip and the caravan and the family and all that. And, uh, so then Jackson and I started just kind of traveling, you know, on our own then. But uh, IDPA has been a big thing for our family. It just, it really has. It was uh, wonderful for uh, for Jackson. It's been good for Evan. And, you know, like I said, when we first got started, we were going to Greenville. And uh, the guy there named Cody Ray. Yep. And I tell you, you talk about just a template for how to do it. It, it, it was there. And a lot of the guys that are managing clubs now uh, and, and trying to host matches and organize and, and just that whole servant leadership thing, mm -hmm. you know, they pick up so much from him because, because they've been to matches that he runs and, and had run. And, uh, and, you know, Brian was, Brian Earler was real uh, influential in hosting matches and, and creating venues. And, and to me, that's kind of what I do now. I mean, my, I've had uh, health complications from surgeries and things. And I, you know, I signed the boys up today for Texas state. I'm not going to be able to shoot it, but I'm going to go. 
And when I get back, I'm going to have ideas for stages and we're going to do them here in Mineola. And uh, I'm going to try to create a venue for the people here, my friends, you know, my yeah. church you now. Right. And, and for my, my friends and my son. So that's just, that's kind of the way I approach it. You know. So how did you, how did you end up in charge of, I met you at when, at lock and load, you guys, I remember. Um, I needed a classifier. My son and I needed a classifier. I swear, I think it was for it was for a match that Brian was putting on over at Cross Timbers. Bug match. It, it was the it was bug, bug bug match, I believe. Ball. Yeah, it was like October, November, I think. Yep, like and that. I'd never shot CCP. CCP was new, yeah. and I we both needed classifiers. So we came out there, or I I contacted you, and you said, you know what. We'll just move our classifier up and we'll do it this weekend. You guys come on out. And yeah. uh, you guys, it was just a, a fantastic bunch. Uh, I had such a great time. Uh, got to meet you, got to meet Jackson uh, and all the rest there. Well, how did you how did you get involved with what was uh, what was the inspiration for starting a club and how did how did you end up running it there at at um, um, uh, lock and load. It, 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 it's going to sound selfish and ugly, but it, it had so much to do with Jackson. I mean, it really did for me. Uh, I had gone to some matches and I'm not, please, please understand. I'm not trying to speak ill of the other sports because I've done the other sports and I still do the other sports. But at that time, my experience with USPSI was really this alpha male gung ho type thing. Mm. IDPA at the time was more laid back, uh, 18 round maximum course of fire, basic equipment. You are responsible for making sure you're shooting from a position of cover. I, you know, remember how it used to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and boy, do I ever. <laughs> yeah, but but because of the people who were involved at the time and the way they made me feel. And here I have a son who at at this time he wasn't quite 12. He was almost there. He was uh I started him at a 10, 10 and a half, I think. And uh I thought, you know, if we do a club at the indoor range, well, it doesn't matter how old he is, he can shoot. And he's going to be up here with this great group of guys that I've been with. He's going to learn something that's really unique. And that will help with his self-esteem more than anything I can think of. And, and, and I just got to be honest with you, that was why. And, and that, and it was something I could do and it would be fun and different at the range. I just, I just, I, I couldn't see where there was any loss in any of it. It was just a win-win every direction I looked. Right. And, uh, so we just jumped on it and went with it and it has proven itself to be more than just win-win for us and for my family, for my kids, for, for my friends. So, uh, what's your, what, when, when you were more active, what was the, uh, in the sport, what, um, what's the favorite division? What's the gun that, that, uh, that you, what was the one you picked up first and gravitated to first? And what's your favorite now? DDP. The 45. Just CDP, yeah. <laughs> and so we I shot CDP, and then I gravitated over to a Glock 35 because that's what I wound up putting Jackson in. And, uh, boy, he just got to where he had really hum one of those things. And, and then I went back to the revolver because I've always just been a wheel gun guy. So I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, for about two or three years, I shot, uh, shot a wheel gun. And, um, then I gravitated back to CDP and I just find myself staying there. And, you know, it's really weird. It's like out of the countless custom 1911s I've built for customers and for myself. And as much as I love them and, and get chapped looking at stupid posts about them, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and I don't even want to go down that trail right now, but, uh, I'm shooting the M&P 45 and I love it. And I'll five can't see getting off of it. Wow. I, to me, perfect gun for this guy. I, I just, for what I like to do. Nice. This is not, this is not a, a 
really a wide open running gun. You're not looking for those, you know, double tap splits like you do in USPSI. I mean, you need to make your hits count in this gun. Yep. And a shorter, lighter gun transitions better. Uh, you know, the, the power factor being what it is in 45 auto, I mean, give me a break. You know, I, it, to me, it's just, I like it. I like it. And, uh, you know, that uh, government models are great. I love them. But uh, there's a big difference between, you know, 41 and 42 ounces in the weight of a polymer gun. Like a short <laughs> right. No kidding. You know, in a big, in a big, you know, grip. So I don't need a mag funnel on that thing. It's as big as a funnel already. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> right. You know, so, and how do you mess up a 45 reload? I mean, you know, it, yeah. you're not paying attention if you mess one of those suckers up. <laughs> so <laughs> so talk, do, talk yeah. about the wheel gun here, because it's, what is it with East Texas and wheel guns? I've heard you and Pops talk about, uh, Pops, uh, Lewis Freeman, talking about the wheel gun and shooting the wheel gun. And, and uh, of course we talked to, to, uh, Sam Chambers, um, a couple yeah. of, a couple of shows back and he was, he's talking about shooting the, the entire season, shooting his revolver. What is it? Oh, yeah. What is it about the wheel gun and, and East Texas? Well, I, I shot a wheel gun in USPSI for a few years. Okay. And, uh, right after I got married, I shot one because it was all I could afford (laughs) (laughs) kind of what I had and just buy a lot of speed loaders, you know, but, uh, I I like a revolver for, uh, uh, IDPA because of the simplicity of it. And, and, you know, I, it tickles me and, and and here it's just going to be like a thread where everybody argues, but here it goes. And now I'm saying I shot it for years. Okay. And, and even before, (laughs) The, the, it, it spots you a little bit more time on the reload. It, usually the make it or break it is it with revolver is the reload. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the accuracy, it is not the capacity. I don't care what anybody says. You are not required to shoot more than 18 rounds on a course of fire. Right. If you hit what you're aiming at, you're fine. And it's that simple. And, and I just, I get tickled when people <laughs> like, it's just such a disadvantage. It ain't a disadvantage it, uh, if you can reload the thing decent. If I mean, you can it really, run it. Yeah. It, it, exactly. You know, now, can I run it like Jerry Mikulik? Nope. <laughs> else? Nope. But it doesn't matter. It's still fun. Uh, I shot, uh, you know, back when they had the big classifier, mm-hmm. you know, I almost hit expert. First rattle off the bat, the first one I shot. And, uh, I was shooting good then. And then I started just, you know, having health issues and taking pills, which made me fatter. And just, uh, it's just, it, I don't know. So now since I don't have wheels, I just go slow and I try to hit, actually try to hit the zero, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I've actually gotten better at that because I don't have any wheels, you know? But, right. uh, do you but think I, the, the, that the, the reason or part of the decline in the interest in, uh, in shooting the revolver is people will try it and then they'll see their scores. And for some reason they still want to, because everyone, everyone keeps talking about the overall, even though there is no overall in, in IDPA oh, and, yeah. that, and they sit the there and compare problem. their score, their times to guys shooting semi-autos and they get despondent about it. Yeah, that, and, and that's the issue. I mean, now, I think we're kind of uh, the exception to the rule in East Texas because we have, and not as much now as we used to, but we have a lot of people that go to sanction matches, okay? But, you know, a lot of people don't. A lot of people just shoot that that club match or, you know, that's kind of where their focus is. And I can't tell you how many guys – and, and they'll say they didn't, but I know they do because I've seen it. <laughs> okay. They went to PCC so they could be at the top of the list. And, and now they got carry optic and they got, you know, CCP and they've added a lot of divisions. So I think it's, it's more along the lines of here's something new. That's a little more modern. Let me try that, you know, and there are advantages, mm-hmm. but, so you kind of forget that you're shooting against other people in your division. Right. And since the other is such a draw, 
you know, those divisions don't have a lot of competitors in them. Hey, before we wrap up, share with us a memory of, of your days of, from one of your trips with, with Jackson to one of, uh, to a, a sanctioned match out of town. <sighs> now I got to tell this one and, and it is <laughs> majorly embarrassing. Our first sanctioned match. Cross Timbers was hosting. It was in Conroe. Everybody's like, oh, you and Jack need to go to the sanction match. So I, okay. So I get to look in and dummy me didn't realize that it wasn't at Cross Timbers. It was at the range in Conroe, but being hosted by Cross Timbers. <laughs> so we weren't anywhere near the range at the hotel we went to. Then we got there, and this windstorm came up, and I mean, it was like we were in Afghanistan, man. I mean, there's the dust and sand stuff blowing all over the place, and and by the time they got the awards handed out and all the freebie stuff, it was like eight thirty nine at night. And I got back, and and I remember Erica looking at me. She said, "Did y'all have fun?" <laughs> First thing out was we had a blast. Hey, I honestly, as embarrassing as it is, and that's what I mean, that's IDPA, brother. I love this game. I love this sport. I love what it offers, the people you meet, what it, the, the benefits. I, it just, I, I, how do you lose playing this game or being involved in helping and organizing or doing something? You know, uh, it, it, it's not to us, it's not a sport, it's just it's a way of life. Yeah. And the you know. and the joy of being able to do it with your kids is uh, makes it all that much more special. You know, and yeah, and and there's not you know there's a, a good number of junior shooters, but there's not a whole lot. And I just when I stop and think about it, how many people treated Jackson like he was their toy? You know, mm. um, I, I probably the most encouragement. And I don't even know that the guy knew he did it. I sent him a mushy text one night when I was about three shades into my meds too deep. But <laughs> Jack just, just, just every now and then, just kind words from Cody Wright to Jackson made all the difference for that kid more than Cody will ever know. Uh, uh, Brian Arler too, same thing with Jackson. Uh, Mike Plato bending over backwards when we had screwed things up or something to make sure that Jackson could get in. It, it just, you know, guys going out of their way, realizing where the future of the sport lies, mm -hmm. makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. And uh, I know it's that way with uh, Evan. Uh, I, I just, you know, the kids don't see it. I see it. I hear it when people come up to me and they're like, me. You know, I'm so proud of your son. I know you are, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we just enjoy. They're such fine young men or I, I look at how he's shooting. Look how he carries himself. And, uh, you know, and, and those kind of things influence them. I know it influenced Jackson and the choices that he made, you know, to, yeah. to uh, go into law enforcement and to, and to do some of the things that he's doing it. It, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's really been a good thing. And I, and I can't thank those guys enough. I just can't do it. And, uh, so when I stop and think about that, you know, I got to pay that forward somehow. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to come on and sit down and talk a little bit. It's great to get a, a chance to chat and I'm looking forward to seeing you at a match real soon. Uh, I look forward to seeing you too. Thank you very much. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your support. Thank you to our guest for coming on the show. And thank you to our awesome sponsor, Matt Shark, for making this entire season possible. If you would, please take a minute to check out our website, Unload Podcast. Um, lots of cool um, previous episodes are there. Links to all sorts of, of great information. Just check out the guest list as well. Uh, join the Facebook group, too, if you want to connect with other fans and get updates on the latest news. You can find that at unloadpodcast.com slash Facebook. Check out our YouTube channel. 
We've got a lot of cool videos there at unloadpodcast.com slash YouTube. And if you'd like to support the show personally, consider becoming a patron just a dollar a month at patreon.com slash unload. And um, for your support, I'll send you out a sticker and you'll have my undying gratitude for your help. If you or someone you know would make an interesting guest for a future episode, you can contact me at unloadpodcast.com. Just uh, go to the contact button in the menu at the top of the page and uh, send me a message. Or you can send me an email at Lloyd, L-L-O-Y-D, at unloadpodcast.com. Tune in again next Thursday for another episode of Unload and Show Clear, powered by Matt Shark. We are a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Be sure to check out all of the other pro-freedom podcasts at selfdefenseradio.com. Dot net.